the coming of our God to fill our world with peace should make us raise our voices high in songs that never cease as judge on clouds of light again he will descend and all his members then unite in joys that never end and now to us today his saving acts he brings in eucharistic mystery come quickly king of kings praise the lord my dear friends happy new year i want to tell you that we love you very much this is father clay hunt the cowboy priest and we've entered into the secular calendar of 2024 hopefully it's going to be a better year than 2023 but we always resolve our new year's resolution is to carry the cross of our lord jesus christ and so as saint paul said we rejoice in the sufferings that we bear with christ or we rejoice in the degree that we participate in the passion of our lord jesus christ and that's true we remember that that one line it's mysterious from the sacred scriptures uh you know it says something like i am no more than a servant of the lord so it is just these things that come to me and that's true we have to psychologically set our mind to that disposition or otherwise we get lost you know we get uh we get overwhelmed we lose our place and we get deceived and that's not a good thing at all so that's why we we have to we have to fortify our understanding very deeply that we're on the pilgrim way of the cross the via dolorosa and that way we're fine god's grace is sufficient to us and even you know, like Christ on the way of the cross, I loved it when he said, Behold, I make all things new. Even in what was seemingly his tremendous defeat, because the world never knew anything about truth. But that's why it's necessary for us to adhere ourselves to truth and to recognize our proper place and to trust to the Lord. This is our singular person proving ground. Each of us has to, has to walk that proving ground. And this is our time. So that's why I want you to do the best. And I'm going to share with you some hopes. Some hopes for this new year of 2024. Some hopes for life. That is our hope, our Lord Jesus Christ, born unto us. And I'm going to read you an excerpt from the typical liturgy of December the 31st, which wasn't proclaimed this year because it was a Sunday. And with, with the following day, the first, you know, who knows what goes on with liturgy in these days? You know, this is such an unfaithful generation. I was talking to many people who couldn't believe that there wasn't even a holy mass in honor to our Blessed Mother Mary, Mother of God. And I can't even hardly believe it myself, but so are the times in which we live. But His grace is sufficient for us. Just as that song said, you probably forgot the lyrics already, but how did it say, I lost my place here, so you're going to have to bear with me to find it. I apologize for that. Here, here it is. It said in the last... In the Eucharistic mystery, 
His saving acts He brings. And that's why regardless of the poverty of the liturgies of these days and the poverty of those who are responsible to bring us Holy Liturgy, we trust to the Lord. And the, the bottom line is we have to be tethered to that Eucharistic mystery because that's the only salvation of the world. That's what Christ was born to give us, the Holy Mass, the Holy Eucharist. And as long as we make it our business, regardless of the peripheral circumstances, and there are many things that aren't right, that is the core of all things. And that's why I encourage you to renew your faith and devotion very strongly in the Holy Eucharist, stronger than ever, and that nothing would be able to stop you from going to the Holy Mass, even daily. That's the greatest wisdom of the whole world, the daily Mass. And that nothing would stop you, not even wild horses. So we're going to go back to that liturgy that was not prayed this year on December the 31st because it was a Sunday. And the first reading from the letter of St. John, that's for the last day of the year. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist was coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. And we recognize that. We feel it in this time. Thus we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us because they are different from us. They do not hold to the deposit of faith. They do not revere what is holy to God. And they propose every kind of wickedness in opposition to what is holy to God. And intentionally they do that. They went out from us, but they do not really, they were never really of our number. That's true. These that wicked document that was that was promulgated from Rome, that's absolutely terrible. And you hear many, many people who are, you know, going back and forth about it. You have bishops and priests and people of knowing who are defending that document. It is absolutely insidious. And they do it out of a hope for goodness and unity, but unity never comes from wickedness. And that document is absolutely an abomination to God, proposing the blessing of couples. And they say, I, I recognize, I've read it. They say, you know, this is not marriage, but it is, it is precisely, they don't, they don't work in the light of day. They operate in the darkness, in confusion. And what is really happening is that, in fact, there are many occurrences of that that are taking place. Blessing of homosexual unions, like marriage. And there will be more of that. And many, many unimaginable evils will come upon us because of that document. And you will see in due time. You will see, and very soon it's already happening, and you will see many abominations take place because of that. Many injustices, many hardships, and already many, many people are not going to, you know, they're turning away to go out of the church. I was just listening to that bishop from Malawi begging his people, God bless that holy bishop. He told them, please. Do not leave the church because you have been so scandalized by this. There are beautiful, faithful people in Malawi and in other countries in Africa. And, and I've seen this with my own eyes. I was a missionary in the Philippines for two years. And I would see, I lived on an island called Cabasan. 
it means rice field. And there would be people who would travel from great distances. This island was probably 30 square miles, 31 villages around the island and a couple up in the mountains. And we just had walking trails, no motorized vehicles. And from miles and miles and monsoon weather, rain and mud, clay slick, having to cross tremendous ravines like on a palm tree that's laid across of, it, across of it, the trunk of a palm tree. I mean, unbelievable things. And you would see women who were 80 years old plus walking even hours and even to a day to make it to the Holy Mass on Sunday. Because on that island, we would go around. Every village had a chapel. It was beautiful. People living hand to mouth, even naked, simple people. I'm talking poor, poor people. The men would would harvest coconuts and and burn them, burn the husk in the ground to make charcoal to send into the city. They would fish and they would grow rice to send into the city. The women's would make mats out of leaves. And one mat took one day to make. And when they sold it into the port city of Tabaco, they would make one dollar for one mat. One dollar a day. That's how poor they were. But they were rich in faith. And just like that bishop said, he said, our poor people scandalized too, who walk from two miles, uh, two days to make it to the Holy Mass, he said. That's amazing. They walk two days to make it to the Holy Mass. He said, how many faithful people do that in New York or in Frankfurt or in Rome? <laughs> no. So it is a tremendous offense to the poor little faith. What is true faith? Like pure gold faith. Pure gold faith of the Anawim, the little people of God. And when they hear that from Rome these things came, from the highest places that they love, that their whole life depends upon in their faith to God, what a scandal. And this beautiful bishop was begging his people, please don't leave the church. And that's what I tell people all the time. Regardless of these shenanigans, regardless of wicked men, make it your business to be absolutely adhered and in fact, all the more zealously to the Holy Confession and to the Holy Eucharist. If you knew what hangs in the balance, you would not let one day pass without going to the Holy Mass. Your whole life would revolve around the Holy Mass if you knew. And that's why I encourage you, if you want to make a New Year's resolution, negotiate and even at sacrifice to make it your business that in 2024 you won't miss one day of the holy mass that you go monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday and obviously sunday that's the third commandment that's a non-negotiable <laughs> that's a non-negotiable but it's possible for you to make sacrifices and to find the holy mass even daily. For some people, it's not possible because of geography, limitations. I would say work, and some people, yes, for work, but a lot of people, no. They would say work. And even on Sunday, they would say work. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But it's possible to strive for such wisdom. And so that's a... This is a sobering message from St. John the Apostle. We continue. Their desertion shows that none of them was our number. And that's true. They never belonged to God. And these wicked persons, these wicked men, they intentionally and insidiously do these things. They desire for confusion, as they have said from their own mouth which is in opposition to Jesus Christ. 
Even the sacred author said, confusion is far from God. He allows the wicked to go into confusion, but he does not operate in confusion. He is order. But you, St. John says, you have the anointing that comes from the Holy One. And that's true from your baptism, from your holy confirmation. You have the anointing that comes from the Holy One. And you have the knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do. And because every lie is alien to the truth. That's why we have to make it our business to live in the truth. The truth is what sets us free. We are not made to operate in the darkness of lies, which the world is full of in this time. But the light is born unto us and you have the freedom to go to the light. And you do know, you have the anointing and the knowledge. It's like uh, I told you before, my, one of my favorite holy men, Brother Ignacio, he said, they, they, don't, they don't think that I know a buttload of crap about the gospel, but I do. That's what St. John is telling you. That line from Nacho Libre was taken from the writing of St. John. You have the knowledge. He said, I'm not writing to you because you do not know, but because you do. You do know, you have the knowledge, and it should be your perpetual effort to increase in the knowledge. You should read and study. You should study the holy man to God, Saint Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He is a saint in heaven. And you should study the holy patristic fathers. You should study the early church fathers. And you should pay attention to holy persons of our own time. Persons who, who teach in truth. And there are many in this time. I encourage you to make it your business to watch, even though I can't stand the YouTube that's a terrible platform. Those guys are as woke as they come. But there are many good things on YouTube and you can watch videos and learn in your free time instead of wasting time in this new year. That you can learn, that you can be in the knowing and that therefore you will be able to move. Because every lie is alien to the truth. So those are the challenges we face going into 2024. That's why these, in these years previous have been wicked times. But I encourage you to make a fresh start in 2024. That's, that's our hope. The new year brings a new hope, a new chance. And I hope that you make it a holy year. And I'm going to share with you the hope and the light of the liturgy that Christ was born unto us to reveal. As he said, I came to reveal to you the fullness of the will of my heavenly father. So this is from New Year's Eve day, which was Sunday. And this liturgy is proper to that day, the feast of the Holy Family the second Sunday of Christmas. And this is from the letter of the Apostle St. Paul to the Ephesians. This is where the rubber meets the road. If you want to be holy to God, listen to these words. This is the daily fleshing out of what it means to be a Christian. St. Paul wrote, defer to one another out of reverence for Christ. That means that we should be subservient to one another, to serve and to put ourselves in disposition to hold the other above ourselves. And that's not an easy task, but it is a possible task. It is possible 
for us to humble ourselves and to serve others. As Christ himself said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life for others. So we can push ourselves to do that. What a great New Year's resolution that would be. And he says in this way, wives should be submissive to their husbands. Whoa! <laughs> All these crazy liberated women of our time, that, that grates on them like nothing else. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. I can see them rearing back in, in arrogant pride like a wild young filly. Refusing to be docile. But it's true that that is what is necessary. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. And I'll tell you, we will encounter soon enough what man should do. But this is specific to the wife. Wives, be submissive to their husbands as if to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of his wife, just as Christ is the head of his body, the church, as well as its Savior. So if women would submit to those words of St. Paul and to be more subservient, this would be a completely different world. But that ain't at all the, the mindset of woman of these times. In fact, quite to the contrary. Woman has surpassed in her wickedness and disobedience than the, than the first woman, Eve. These women of the modern day are like Eve on steroids. And I'm talking to the most part. I mean, obviously there's some holy women. There are some holy women that I admire tremendously. And they are very powerful. But the greater majority and in fact the vast majority of women do not think in right way even to the slightest degree to God. And therefore, many, many problems come unto our time. Just as those problems came unto the whole of creation, pointedly to the woman Eve. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Amazing. If a woman would ponder that one single paragraph of St. Paul and pray on it throughout the year, there could be a monumental shift in the whole world. It does not mean to be a slave. It does not mean to be debased. But quite to the contrary, as always, the wisdom of God is polar opposite to the wisdom of the world. So the wisdom of the world would say to women, you know, these things of encouragement to be a feminist, to be a liberated woman. But that is in opposition and consequential opposition to the truth revealed to us by God through the Holy Apostle Paul. But don't get all worked up, women. Listen to the part uh, on the men. And this is two men, which many and most men do not do in this time. I would say, as a whole, before men were more bad behaving in times past. But women are absolutely more bad behaving than men in these times. Look at these crazy women all over the world. Godless Jezebels behaving like prostitutes, mindless women. And unfortunately, given, given the path to it, they freely run in it. I mean, woman in general is ridiculous in these days. But listen to what is required of man. And there are many, many men who are lacking in this, even though they may be in some slight degree better behaving than women in our time. 
husbands, love your wives as Christ loved his bride, the church. How is that? It means he was crucified. That's what it means, women. Men have to be crucified to put up with you. And you have to be crucified to put up with men. It is a mutual self-giving. And when a couple, when a man, <laughs> you got to be careful. How do they define couple these days? Oh my goodness. When a married couple, when a man and woman freely give themselves into that, it becomes, it becomes very beautiful. I've seen it with my own eyes, even in this life. There are married couples who are surpassing in beauty because they are individually, uh, you know, they are individually solicitous to fulfill their responsibility. The woman to be submissive to her husband and the husband to love his woman like Christ loved his bride, the church, meaning he is a perpetual living sacrifice, spreading his arms out on the cross. And even it becomes beautiful and fulfilling. As Christ said, behold, I make all things new to his passion. Christ gave himself up for her to make her holy. It should be the role of man. You, it should be the desire, O oh man, that you have in your heart, that your wife be holy to God and that you do everything you can to facilitate that. Purifying her in the bath of water by the power of the word to present himself a glorious church. This is the work of Christ, holy and immaculate without stain or wrinkle or anything of that sort. And that's the long lost perfect image of the divinity of the church. There have been golden ages of the church where everything you might say is like an engine was firing on all cylinders. She was immaculate and beautiful, but definitely not in this time. And in fact, this time is the worst of times. There has never been a time so wicked and so disfiguring to the bride of Christ as this time. 2024. The sacred author continues, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. And that's true because they are one body. But I don't know a whole lot of men that do that. By one degree of selfishness or another, men have abdicated this responsibility to love their wives as their own body. Because it would be a whole different story if you treasured, if you cherished the gift of woman that God has given to you, oh man. It would be beautiful. You would be happy and they would be happy. And I hope that you strive for that, even for all the complications of life. I was just talking to a woman the other day and she was like, but Father, I just despise my, my husband from all these years, 50 years, that she has been yoked by that heavy burden. And I told her it's worth a try to, to love him anew as Christ loved his bride, the church. That you pray for the gift to be able to serve your husband. It's possible for that. We can will ourselves to self-giving even if it is not mutual. It is possible for the human person to be faithful to the vows that they made to God for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health all the days of our life until death do we part. It's possible to do that. And I guarantee you right now, there are many 
women and men who are clicking off this teaching because they don't want to hear it. They close their ears lest they hear and they cover their eyes lest they see and that they be able to have conversion. Because in some way, as the sacred author said, they prefer the darkness to the light. They refuse to surrender their own little fiefdom, even though they are never happy in that fiefdom. Why do you think that so many people self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and every other kind of rebellious behavior? Husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. What a great wisdom. He who loves his wife loves himself. I encourage you men to make a New Year's resolution to love your wives more and better. To put yourselves to serve rather than to be served. And to allow for the burden of, of weight to come down on your shoulders. And God will give you the strength. I promise you, if you surrender and submit to that, God will give you the strength and you will find better times ahead. I promise you that. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife and the two shall be made into one. This is a great foreshadowing, St. Paul said. I mean that it refers to Christ and the church. In any case, each one should love his wife as he loves himself. The wife, for her part, showing respect for her husband. Beautiful. I told that woman, I hope that you cook for him. I hope that you wash his clothes. And she told me, Father, I don't cook for him because he doesn't want me to. And I don't wash his clothes. I said, well, maybe it's a good time to start again to renew your vows to God. To have and to hold, to love and to serve all the days of your life. It would be a completely different world if men and women would do that. That is a great wisdom. And I'm telling you, if the church did that, the, the laity, God would give the grace for the hierarchy to be renewed. I hear the laity saying, and rightfully so, this is the worst hierarchy in the history of the world. And I believe it is. But if you were faithful on your part, the Lord would give you good and holy shepherds. That there would be a new era of peace on the world. But you have to be the one to make the first step to do your part first. As St. Francis said, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. It has to start in the heart of the human person, not out there somewhere. Right here. Right here. I hope that you do it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. As everything has fallen down in this time, intensity is upon this commandment also, the fourth one. Intense pressure against this commandment. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And we have to constantly fight for that. Regardless of whatever human poverty. We have to strive for obedience and reconciliation and, and humility. And to never close the door to that. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment to carry a promise with it. This is interesting. It is the first commandment to carry a promise with it. Listen what the Lord promised. That it may go well with you 
and that you may have long life on earth. Wow, very interesting. And that's why it is to our benefit to honor our father and our mother. Fathers, do not anger your children. Bring them up with the training and instruction befitting to the Lord. That is discipline and love has to be from a father. Discipline in love. Discipline and love. It is necessary to love others more than ourselves. It is necessary to, to rather compromise our own freedom for the sake of the other than to push our own agenda at the sacrifice of other relationships. And then it followed by a beautiful teaching of Pope Paul the Sixth. Pope Paul the Sixth. So he is contemporary to many of our lives. In fact, I was alive when he was Pope. And these are beautiful words because it goes to even beyond, like we're talking about the importance of marriage and family. Well, that that has to to function at full capacity. It has to be, uh, you know, all the the individual persons on board with it, which it's not always the case. But this reading goes to the heart of the individual, and that's where each of us has the full capacity to exercise these things, the full potential to exercise these things. It's not to say that they are being exercised, but we have the full potential. So let's listen to these beautiful words of Pope Paul VI. And it's titled, Nazareth, a model. Nazareth is a kind of school where we begin to discover what Christ's life was like and even to understand his gospel. So Nazareth was where Mary and Joseph took Jesus back when they were able to return there, their own town, and that's where Jesus was raised. So this is before his public ministry before he broke onto the scene worldwide. This is before all those things. This is the formation, the quietness, the hidden place of Nazareth. And each of us has to have our own little Nazareth within our hearts. Here, we can observe and ponder the simple appeal of the way God's Son came to be known profound yet full of hidden meaning, and gradually we may even learn to imitate Him. See, this is the discipline of Christian discipleship, Nazareth. And it's possible for us to make a New Year's resolution to Nazareth. You can tell the Lord in your prayer, I resolve to go to Nazareth for this New Year, Lord. Instruct me in your ways, as Brother Ignacio would say. In your ways, O oh Lord. And that's beautiful. Because the church is built of living stones, individual stones. That's us. So if we are not holy, then the church is not holy. But if we are holy, then the church becomes holy. It is built up. Of holy people and that's a a most coveted commodity for this time we need holy people we need people who understand to the Lord and who belong to the Lord individually in their own hearts and that's why it is 
so necessarily important for you to find your Nazareth. Here we can learn to realize who Christ really is. And here we can sense and take account of the conditions and the circumstances that surround and affected his life on this earth, the places, the tenor of the times, the culture, the language, the religious customs, in brief, everything which Jesus used to make himself known to the world. That in fact, we may leaven the temporal order as Jesus did. Here, everything speaks to us. Everything has meaning. Here, we can learn the importance of spiritual discipline for all who wish to follow Christ. Amen. And to live by the teachings of His gospel. Amen. That's what we need. How I would like to return to my childhood and me as well. Things were far more innocent at that time. Far more light than the heavy burden of these days. And to attend the simple yet profound school that is Nazareth. How wonderful to be close to Mary. Yes, Mary was the most faithful person, the most faithful human person in the history of the world to God. Amazing. And it's possible that we could learn again the lessons of the true meaning of life, learning again God's truths. But here we are, On pilgrimage, time presses, and I must set aside my desire to stay. And I must carry on my education in the gospel. Yes, we have to increase. We have to take the risk of going out. It's like the little hobbits from the Shire. They didn't want to leave, but they had to. They had to go out into the big wide world and increase in their understanding. For the, the education of the gospel, the Pope said, is never finished. And that's true. We are in a perpetual learning curve, increasing. But I cannot leave without recalling briefly and passing some thoughts that I take with me from Nazareth. First, we learn from its silence. Very important for 2024. Resolve to find some silence. If only we could once again appreciate its value. We need this wonderful state of mind beset as we are by the cacophony of strident protests and conflicting claims to characteristic, too characteristic of these turbulent times. It seems like he was des describing to a T 2024. You see little Gusty coming there too to receive some words of wisdom. The silence of Nazareth should teach us how to meditate in peace and quiet, to reflect on the deeply spiritual. You need to, to find your moments, even for a brief time every day, to be in silence and to be open to the voice of God's inner wisdom and the counsel of His true teachers. Because it's not easy to distinguish true teachers from false teachers in these times. You have to be sharp spiritually to God. Nazareth can teach us the value of study and preparation. I wish that you would study all the time another tremendous wisdom from the holy man, Brother Ignacio, when he told those little niños, Go! Go away, read some books. You have to do spiritual studies. You have to do spiritual readings. Most importantly, the Bible and other spiritual readings that you may increase to God. That you may be knowing to these things. Nazareth can teach us this place of study and preparation of meditation 
of a well-ordered personal spiritual life and of silent prayer that is known only to God. Beautiful. Sometimes we pray together, but there has to be also the times that we pray alone in silence that only the Lord knows. The silence that only the Lord knows. Second, he said, we learn about family. May Nazareth serve as a model of what family should be. Yes, the holiness of family. Fight in your own person and in your family to preserve the bonds of peace and unanimity, even though that is a tremendously daunting task in these times where the whole world desires to tear us apart. May it show us the family's holy and enduring character and exemplify its basic function in society. The whole of society depends on the stability of family. When, a fam when families are strong, society is strong. When families are destroyed, the, si the society is destroyed. The family, a community of love and sharing, beautiful for the problems it poses and the rewards it brings. Beautiful for the problems it proposes and the rewards it brings. And some, the perfect setting for rearing children is the family. And for it, there is no substitute. God bless to all the little ones who have had to endure and who are enduring the selfishness of their parents for divorce, the, f the selfishness of the ones responsible for divorce, absolutely wicked. It's, it's one of the root wickednesses of all things. All the problems of the world have their origin in divorce. Lord have mercy. Finally, in Nazareth, the home of the craftsman's son, we must learn to work, yes, and the discipline that entails. I encourage you to make a New Year's resolution to work and to work hard. That you are not lazy, that you are not, you know, remiss to be responsible to work, but then in, you s insist upon yourself to be busy about work. I would especially recognize the value of work, the Pope says, demanding yet redeeming. That was the first mandate from the Lord. By the sweat of your brow, O oh man, you will bring forth produce for your family. You will provide for your family, no longer freely in the garden, but by the sweat of your brow. And when a man fulfills that, he is greatly strengthened. I encourage young men and men to work hard. Never suck off the teat of the United States or any other governing body. But pull yourself up by your bootstraps to work. It is redeeming even for its demands. And it deserves proper respect. I would remind everyone that work is its own dignity. And that's true. We are dignified in work. On the other hand, it is not the end in itself. God is. We do not make a God out of our work. Some people do that, and that's not okay. But it is very dignifying. And we recognize it is ordered to the Lord. He, the master of the vineyard, and we are about the work in His vineyard. Its value and its and free character, however, derive not only from its place in the economic system, as they say, but rather for the purpose that it serves.
to the good of others. That's why work is dignified. It's not just self-serving. In closing, I express my deep regard for people everywhere who work for a living. Amen to that. God bless the working man. God bless the labors of woman, the greatest labor of woman, to be a homemaker. That's the greatest honor and dignity of woman. And that in itself makes a tremendous difference in the whole world. I wish that more women would go back to being the queen of the household and to raise their children strong at home and to be served as a queen by their man. That he would bow and honor the greatness of woman in the home. To them, I would point out their great model, Christ, their brother, our Lord and God, who is their prophet in every cause that promotes their well-being. God bless Pope Paul VI. And God bless to each of you. I hope that you do not lose heart. And in fact, that you, that you are determined to make 2024 a better year, a holy year. And that you are determined to make that happen starting with your own person. That you insist to be more holy to God. That you insist to be more faithful to God in all these things of which we have discussed. And I give you the blessing. The Lord be with you. And for this new year of 2024 that we started with the what should be the holy day of obligation in honor to our Blessed Mother Mary, Mother of God. Through that faithful disciple to God and most magnificent example of everything that is true and perfect to God. May the Lord bless you and your family. And we consecrate you anew in this new year to the sacred heart of Jesus through her immaculate heart. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Adios. Bye.